Hello, lovelies. You're listening to episode 44 of the Broken Enchantments podcast, written and read by Elizabeth Wheatley. That's me. I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Be sure to check out my Patreon for next week's episode, now available. You can check out the links below. Happy listening. The next time Janir woke, she was roused by the same slave girl who had been there the first time. At least, she thought it was. The recollection was rather blurred and confused. Her head spun, voices and visions overlapping in the final echoes of a dream. It took Janir a moment to remember where she was, but she didn't feel the blinding terror of before. Her bruises throbbed and her head ached. Her senses felt thick, cumbersome slow to process. Yet that didn't stop her from noticing that the door to the balcony had been padlocked. That stung a little, but she supposed they hadn't known what she would do. I'm Genvisa, my lady, the slave said demurely. I'm your healer, for the time being. Hello? Janir mumbled, not sure what else to say. Where am I? The slave glanced to the open door of the bedroom. Your rooms, in the palace at the Dasha. Do you remember speaking to the Lord Argotalum earlier? Janir nodded clumsily and the girl's shoulders visibly relaxed. I just... Don't push yourself too hard, the healer hurriedly put in. She rested a hand on Janir's shoulder, gingerly, cautiously. You've... Slept for close to thirteen hours. Do you need to use the privy? Janir did, but she hadn't wanted to ask. Jemvisa helped her to the garter robe and maintained calm objectivity. Embarrassment burned Janir's cheeks, but she was too weak to do everything on her own. A varied array of bruises left her sore and aching. After, the healer helped Janir to a low table where a light morning meal had been laid out. There were no chairs, only cushions on the floor. Jimvisa helped her ease down and set to pouring tea and laying out fish and rice in a small bowl. Janir had just finished her first cup of tea and half the fish and rice when the outer door to her apartment opened. There was no knock, and in a few moments, Kinistrith filled the doorway to Janir's bedchamber. Janir's every muscle went tight at the sight of the woman. Kinistrith lingered over the threshold. Janir, do you know who I am? Her words came out haltingly, hesitantly. She seemed almost as uncertain as Janir herself. The answer came sluggishly to Janir's memory. Mortana Canistrith, are you all right if Jimvisa leaves? Janir's heart hammered harder. She made eye contact with the slave. Don't go, springing off her lips before she could stop it. Jemvisa glanced to Kinistrith, and the Mortana waved for her to carry on with straightening Janir's bed. If Jemvisa stays, can I join you? Janir hunched over the ceramic teacup, closing her eyes. You don't need to be afraid, Kinistrith assured her. It's all right. I suppose, Janir mumbled. She focused on breathing the steam, the gentle, soothing heat. Gnistrith cautiously took up a place on the opposite side of the low table. She made no sudden moves and kept Janir in her line of sight. How are you feeling? I hurt, Janir quietly answered. I don't know how I got here. Her heart sped up, hammering against her chest. I... A sharp pang through her skull cut off that thought. It's all right. What happened? Janir rubbed her throbbing temple. What's wrong with me? You were abducted. Kinistrith took the teacup from her and set it on the table before it spilled. Traitors against your father took you on your way from the coast, on a routine patrol. They killed all your guards and held you for weeks before we managed to locate you and free you. Janir squeezed her eyes shut. What did they do to me? Kinistrith hesitated for a long time before answering. 
We don't know for sure. It had something to do with Chetan Shrai and Karkatan. To be honest, we weren't sure you would survive. Chetan Shrai? The arts of Karkatan torture. Black rods grinding against naked flesh, screams and keens bouncing off stone walls. Fire in the veins, burning, scorching, charring, throbbing welts, oozing blood like ink. Black and blood, black and blood. Janir! Canistrith grabbed for her, then stopped short as Janir yanked back. It's all right, Canistrith hurriedly assured her. Janir, it's all right. Janir hadn't even realized she was shaking, doubled over with her fingers tangled in her hair. She shuddered, rocking back and forth as she fought to compose herself. Jimvisa was at her side the next moment, rubbing her unbruised forearm. You're safe now, my lady. You're safe. Just breathe. That's it. Breathe. You're all right. Jimvisa coaxed her upright, soothing voice relaxing her into serenity. The nagging fear lingered at the back of her mind, but she managed to lock it away for now. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to remind you. Knistrith shooed Jimvisa to the other side of the room again. I'm very sorry, but can you tell me about the patrol? What happened before? Janir had never been on patrol in her life, for all she knew. No. Canistrith licked her lips. Can you remember when you set out? Again, Janir tried for just a moment, thinking back to before she had woken up. Her headache only worsened. What about before that? Canistrith prompted. Janir sighed with frustration. It's all right. Canistrith calmly assured her. There's no rush. No matter how hard she tried, there was nothing. All was a grey fog of abstract senses and convoluted impressions. That man, Janir shook her head, the Brevian. He protected me. What do you mean? I... Janir rubbed between her eyes, but the ache only increased. The elf with the silver hair, he... he wanted to hurt me, but the man with the boots... She had been small, so small. Curled under a table, then riding in front of a saddle, the Brevian's broad arms on either side. His voice had been thick and dark, like honey. Jenny, he had called her. Canistrith reached out and lightly brushed Janir's arm, almost experimentally. Eight years ago, when you were a captive... Janir swallowed, nodding. She didn't pull away this time. Canistrith sighed sympathetically. That's not a nice place to have your memories stop. Janir's mother had died that day, she thought. But the Brevian had been kind. There had been something sticky bandaged on the side of her neck. Janir reached up to the barely perceptible scar that ran along the base of her neck. It's all right, child, Canistrith assured her. You're an Argotolum? and you'll make a fine recovery. I'm not sure I remember, Janir replied with apprehension. I'm not sure I remember anything. Even me. She groaned and put a hand to her forehead. I can't. I try to see, but it's just, it's all in the mist. That didn't make sense once Janir said it out loud, but Canistrith didn't question. Don't try to remember what you can't, Janir. Canistrith chided. You will only frustrate yourself and make it worse. Janir bit her lower lip. Do... do you think they'll come back? She nervously asked, her voice almost a whisper. Even if they don't, Janir, you have no need to worry. I'm sure you'll make a full recovery in time. The Lord Argotalum had said something to Canistrith, something about orders and damage. Janir felt there was something wrong something odd about it. Yet, she didn't know how to ask. Later that day after supper, Canistrith had Janir put on an overcoat and slippers before they went for a walk with Janvissa through the palace garden. Canistrith didn't push her, didn't ask her questions. Yet the whole while, Janir was searching for some spark of recognition. There were vaguely familiar places she might or might not have known. What was wrong with her? Janir picked up a fallen leaf from the stone walkway. She kneaded it in her fingers, feeling the natural texture of the plant. She studied the light green network of veins spreading out from the leaf's stem, 
such an intricate creation, and yet it was so much simpler than the swirling, unstable mass of ideas and impressions that was her consciousness. At least Jeanne remembered how to read and write and how to ride, though Canistrith wouldn't let her clamber aboard a horse just yet. Jeanne could read for just under an hour before her eyes began to hurt and her mind began to wander. If she couldn't do anything other than walk and read, she wanted to do it all day. But if she walked too long, she became fatigued, and if she read too long, her mind started to feel cramped, and she was forced to stop. She read histories, biographies, the great Argotolum houses, and even attempted a text on Chetan Shrai, the art of Carcotton torture. That book made her shudder more than once, and there was only so much she could bear to read at a time. The dubious nature of Carcotton and what they could do filled that book and entire tomes. It seemed not even the most learned scholars knew for sure what made Carcotton wound and other times outright kill, but wielder intentions seemed to play a large role. Regardless, it was generally believed that Carcotton took on a likeness to their Argotolum, and their wielder's will was thereby acted out. The authors of these texts seemed to think it far more predictable than Janir did. Perhaps she misunderstood. The Lord Argotolum came to see her in the evenings. His visits were usually brief, but he never missed one. His guards would wait in the hall while he visited her alone. He never acknowledged them, but Janir could sense their obsidian auras just beyond the wall. The fourth night, Janir was in her sitting room on the floor, a small writing desk over her lap while she practiced copying out a brief excerpt from one of her history books. The sleeves of her dressing gown trailed in ink and her fingers were stained with spots of blue. She tried to make her quill form the runes correctly, but all the strokes kept slanting to the left or were too far apart no matter how hard she tried. It always happened after she had been writing for more than an hour or so. Janir crumpled the thin parchment and tossed it into the growing mound of failures in front of her. She dipped her quill in the ink again and bent over a fresh sheet of parchment, ham poised above the page for a moment before she tried yet again. Well, this explains the recent paper shortage. The Lord Argotolum nudged a pile of mutilated parchment with the toe of his boot. Janir hadn't heard him enter her apartment. Lord Father... Canistrith and the books had taught her that there were some protocols concerning the Lord Argotolum which should never be breached, no matter how casual the circumstances. Janir. Her father sat on the couch behind her and wordlessly watched as she struggled to write the runes, so they were at least recognizable. But Janir failed again, and it was all the worse because her father had seen her fail. She crumpled the paper and hurled it to the mound before she dipped her quill in the inkwell again. That's enough, Janir. The Lord Agatolum caught her hand. Put it away for now. Janir reluctantly capitulated. She stored the quill and inkwell inside the top of the desk before sliding the entire wooden box under the end table next to the couch. Come here, my child. The Lord Agatolum motioned to a place beside him. Janir obeyed and settled onto the couch. The Lord Agatolum had a box with him that she hadn't noticed before, a polished mahogany box tucked under one arm. He held it toward her and swung it open. Laid out side by side on a velvet cushion were two black rods, engraved with twisting patterns. There was a curved shape to one end of each, forming a hilt. Janir instantly ached to snatch them up. I kept these because we didn't know what you would be like when you awakened, he explained. Here. As soon as she touched them, there was a sensation of balance and stability that she hadn't felt in days. The feeling wore off the longer she held them and quieted into a warm sense of belonging. They're your carcotton, the Lord Agatolum said. The tears of a griffin, the scales of a weirwarg, and a few drops of your blood, melted together and forged into the perfect weapon. He drew a similar rod from his belt. After displaying it a moment, he replaced his carcotton beside its twin. I believe it's time you started to review carcotton play. Canistrith is to begin teaching you tomorrow. Janir nodded absently. Her father handed her the mahogany box, and she placed her carcotton back inside. Thank you. The Lord Argotolum acknowledged her thanks with a grunt. I will be leaving in a few weeks. Canistrith wanted me to wait to tell you. Leaving? Janir's chest clenched at the thought. We are at war with the Brevians. 
No, don't try to remember. You'll only frustrate yourself. We are lending the Slavish a magical relic of ours to aid their armies. The Lord Argatolum elaborated. I shall go with the vanguard to Valmachen, where half the Slavish army awaits. I don't expect to be gone more than one or two months, but I thought you should know now. Jynir was quiet, processing and storing the information. One of my most trusted advisors, Morton Haverless, shall be regent in my absence. Canistrith will continue to look after you. Jynir nodded and was quiet. She wasn't sure how she felt about her father leaving. She decided she didn't like it. Must you go? I have already postponed this journey several times, on account of you or the weather. The snows were late in Brevia this winter, but now they linger to make up for it. The Lord Agatolum tucked a loose strand of Janir's hair behind her ear. You want to ask something? It wasn't a question. Janir hesitated. What is the relic? I mean, if you don't want to tell me, I'll understand, but... It's a chalice. Allegedly, it holds the blood of Malvrin, collected from a wound he took in his final battle. The essence of war? Janir had forgotten much, but her religious studies were oddly intact. Canistrath had rolled her eyes when she found out, but made no comment. Yes. No one is quite sure of how old it is, but it remained in the treasure room of the Elven Kings until recently. How did you get it? Janir couldn't help her amazement. It was even possible to steal from the heart of the Sylvan Forest? The Lord Argatolum gave his daughter a sideways glance and said nothing. The story is true, then. The legends of the clever elvish warrior who wounded him with his own sword? I do not pretend to hold any great belief in the tales of bygone times and ancient powers. But whether the chalice contains the blood of an essence or not, it holds great amounts of power. It is a pity we cannot spell the Argatolum army. I suppose it is the price our race pays for invulnerability. So, Brevia will be conquered? The Lord Argatolum nodded with traces of a smile. Certainly. Jynir studied her hands, nodding them atop the mahogany box. This troubles you. No, I... Jynir cleared her throat. So many people die in wars. Soldiers and not. I just... She wove her hands together, locking them down. Forgive me. The Lord Argatolum didn't reply for a long time. When she finally looked up to him, she caught the slight flare of his nostrils. It is an unfortunate reality of the world. He touched her shoulder once before standing to leave. You have your mother's heart. Janir wasn't sure if he meant that as a good thing. You have been listening to Broken Enchantments. Written and read by Elizabeth Wheatley. Don't forget to check out my Patreon for early access to episodes, bonus content, and lots of patrons-only freebies. You can learn more at elizabethwheatley.com. And don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or YouTube. I'll see you next time.